Hi, everybody. How's it going? This is John Fisher, your Director of Growth and Alumni Services for the CAIFI National Office. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry for the slight delay. We had a little bit of technical issues on um, my end, trying to get the audio going and all of that. And you know, just trying to get everything going and making sure everything sounds really good for you all. So um, thank you for hanging tight. But we're joined today by Brother Matt Scheller. So thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. How are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. I'm fantastic. It's, uh, it's good to be here, brother. Awesome. Well, before we get started, we always um, ask our guests a couple rapid fire questions just to try to get to know you a little bit. Um, are you ready for that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm buckled in. Let's do it. Awesome. So really easy question. Where are you from? Uh, I grew up in a little town called uh, Kutztown, Pennsylvania, in um, uh, outside of Philadelphia, about an hour and a half northwest. And now I currently live right in the city of Philadelphia. Awesome. So you're a little disappointed Congress got pushed back a little bit <laughs> from being in Philadelphia. Uh, the, the, the silver lining is that the uh, 150th anniversary of my chapter uh, is uh, is now going to coincide perfectly with Philadelphia uh, Congress, which is which is exciting. And I'm looking forward to that. I love your chapter house, and I love getting to Lehigh. It's a beautiful town, so I'm excited for that as well. Awesome. Uh, um, so you obviously went to Lehigh. What'd you study? Uh, I studied architecture. I had a little okay. bit of a circuitous path. I started with engineering, um, and uh, I ended up taking a semester off to shadow an engineering firm because it seemed really boring in the academic world. And yeah, and uh, and. Indeed, I, I confirmed that it was boring in the, in, in the workplace. So I came back and uh, and did architecture, which I, which I love, and that's what I uh, that's what I do now for a living. Awesome. So, what made you decide to join Chi Phi while you were at Lehigh? It's a great question. So Lehigh um, is a relatively small private school, and uh, it has a really big Greek life. It's diminished a bit since when I was there. I graduated back in two thousand seven. Um, but it's, it's still a big part of the, uh, social life at, at Lehigh. So, uh, I, I knew nothing about fraternities prior to coming to Lehigh. I actually boarded off campus for my first year, okay. um, in, in a different fraternity house that I did not join. Um, but in any event, the living advisor at that fraternity house that was off campus, uh, was a chi Phi brother and he introduced me to chi Phi. I fell in love with the brothers. We, um, have a lot of history at Lehigh and he, uh, oddly enough and coincidentally enough, talked about ritual a lot, um, nice. how, how much we focused on and how the cool aspect of that. Um, so it, it, I really got hooked. So, so Kai, Kai Fi was the one for me. Nice. And we're happy to have you. I'm very happy that you're involved. Um, so what was one of your favorite memories as an undergraduate? Of course, anything that you could share, you know. Um. Sure. Yeah, I guess <laughs> Censor the top ten. No, just, yeah. <laughs> just uh, you know there there were. Uh, that's a tough question because there were a lot. Um, again, not to circle back to ritual, but the ones that like really make me emotional were the ones related to to to, to ritual. Um, okay. It seemed to be the most in, impactful for me going going through a lot of our ceremonies. I mean, of course, there were a lot of great social moments. Um, as well. And, you know, I should say the, the um, I was fortunate to be the new member educator okay. um, one year and, and just, you know, working with, with, the, with the new men and seeing them grow um, and become brothers. And that, you know, that whole experience was, uh, was really impactful. For sure. And then, you know, it was obviously impactful while you're an undergraduate, right? So that led into you becoming an alumni. What made you decide to continue your involvement? You know, you're relatively young, um, as compared to other alumni that tend to be involved as much as you are. So, you know, what, what led to that? Um, you know what, I, um, I, I, got, I got involved pretty heavily as an alumnus not too far after graduating. Um, and uh, a very good friend of mine and a, another brother, he's a number of years older than I am, his name is uh, Brother Jay Crosby. Okay. And he actually uh, pulled me onto the Alumni uh, Association board and, and got me involved um, in, in a bunch of stuff. So I really have to credit it, credit all of it to him. He really got me in, engaged. And once I got engaged, I realized how rewarding it was mm -hmm. um, to help out the local chapter and now ultimately help out on, on, on a national level. Um, as, as wonderful as the undergraduate experience is, 
um, my, my most prized memories, and I'm still forming them every year, um, and experiences uh, of being a Chi Phi are, are happening as, as an, an alumnus. And that's awesome. Um, you know, you're, you've been involved on the Grand Council in several different positions, and currently you're serving as the Grand Zeta. Um, what does that job entail for anyone that doesn't know? Yeah, the, the Grand Zeta is the, um, you know, the textbook definition is the is a historian uh, of, of the fraternity, just like on a local level, uh, the Zeta acts as the historian, but also should, you know, should be logging um, the, the history of the, of the fraternity. So uh, on a national level for the council, um, essentially, you know, my, th that is my, my same role, but I, I've been really focusing on ritual, mm -hmm. which of course it is our, is our history. And uh, I, I, I took the role as Grand Zeta to, to um, uh, in, in the direction of, of really working toward bolstering ritual education and ritual education opportunities and awareness in the fraternity. That's sort of been my, um, my, my main mission since I've been involved uh, in the role. And, and prior to Grand Zeta, I was Grand Epsilon um, in working uh, in a similar fashion. Okay. And then... You've also been involved with the uh, the Chronicles being updated. How's yeah, that that's, going? Yes. Yeah, so when I got past the baton to be Grand Zeta, the former Grand Zeta was, was spearheading that task and, um, and and did a great job. And I, I took it over. And uh, it's a really exciting project. We have the first two editions of, of the Chronicles out. And the third edition is from the uh, 1970s to, to pretty much right now. And we're going to, we have some really cool ideas of how we're going to, package it and potentially a, a box set and launch it uh, close to our bicentennial in 2024. Huge moment for the fraternity and really exciting to, um, to be the, the one to lead the charge on that and, and make sure we have a really amazing uh, historical document for, for our fraternity. Really, really unique moment uh, for us. I'm ready to read it. <laughs> I've heard yeah. it's going to be a little bit easier reading this time. I'm going to that front, front to back. I'm going to quiz uh, you on it. I'm going to try. Don't make the test too hard. <laughs> and then the hardest question you're going to get all day, what's your uh, three favorite movies of all time? Uh, these questions are the worst. I always do terrible at them. So I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit and be a little vague. So I love, uh, I love James Bond movies. Okay. I, I always have just the fact they take place in uh, – in exotic parts of the world, it kind of gives you uh, peaks into areas that, of the world that you generally uh, aren't afforded the opportunity to go. So I, I always like those. Um, oddly enough, the original version of It, okay. um, I, I, I always like, I, I watched it when I was too young and had nightmares for years. And it always stuck with me. <laughs> it was something, <laughs> something eerily nostalgic about it for me. Uh, and then, um, and then I'm, I'm, the, the third, again, isn't specific. It, Wes Anderson movies. Okay. Uh, I, I, I love all of those. I just love his cinematography and the way he composes really unique storylines and the way he, he, he is able to um, uh, visually uh, then articulate those storylines. I, I think those movies are so uh, stimulating. Okay. Which Bond is the best? Oh, uh, I, you know what? Well, I was the Sean Connery Bond. Is that are you referring to the actor or a specific movie? I would I mean, just say Sean, who, Sean Connery. Yeah, a specific movie would yeah. be Sean Connery to, to, to nail down. But uh, in terms of actor for Bond, I, I prefer the uh, the Connery years. Okay. Okay. Very <laughs> iconic. So that's good. Yeah. Right. Right. Awesome. So you know, I wanted to get you on this um, interview to just talk about our history and our ritual, and you know how it ties us together as chi Fi brothers and you know, what better way to start than, you know, let's dive into our history a little bit. Um, unfortunately, some of our brothers may not be as aware of, you know, how unique our ritual and our history are. So, you know, if you don't mind explaining, you know, a real high level view of our founding as an organization, just, you know, a quick synopsis to give people an idea. Sure. Yeah. The, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because I, I find uh, too often, unfortunately, that um, a, a lot of us brothers, uh, both alumni and undergraduate, um, can't really speak to our history even on a high level. Mm -hmm. And you know, Chi-Fi is not 
it's, it's not it's not a club or a special organization linked together through ritual through a brotherhood um and uh we'll talk more about that yeah. later but, but it's really important that we understand you know generally what our what our or, origins are so you know kai fi it's it's rumored um there's really no specific proof of this but emerged from uh, Bavaria, uh, many, many uh, centuries ago, there was a mystic order called, known as Kaifi, and um, these were secret organizations called chapels, and then eventually those chapels came to the, to the U.S. and spread throughout the U.S., and, um, and, and that's how sort of the name Kaifi came, came to the States, but more specifically, what we do know for certain is that we emerge out of three different orders, um, and these three orders are the the Princeton Order, the Southern Order, and the Hobart Order. And these all acted independently at first, which is pretty interesting. So the, the first of these three orders is the Princeton Order. Um, and that was originally founded in 1824, um, which makes us the oldest social fraternity in the United States, which is a, a pretty cool fun yeah. fact, if, if you don't know that. It didn't last very long, um, lasted about a year, and, and it was actually comprised of not undergraduates, but, but faculty. And um, back then, the Princeton University was called the College of New Jersey. And, um, and basically, it was faculty and some clergymen, because there, there, there was a seminary as well. And um, they were talking, they wanted, they, they wanted to talk about um, politics and religious ideas that were not mainstream. So they, they actually had to do this in secret. And today, the, I, the secrecy of the fraternity is more tradition than it is necessity. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was, it was necessity. Um, eventually, that, or not eventually, rather quickly, um, that's, that stopped um, because they didn't want to get caught. And, and there was a sentiment um, you know, at the time to not permit those sort of organizations. So, so that that's ceased to... Continue. Then there was a long period of time. Then in 1854, the Princeton Order uh, reemerged when uh, the ritual and some, some some minute books of the original 1824 order were found. Um, so it was it was resurrected um, again as the Princeton Order, and, and this was known as the Kai Fi uh, Kai Fi Society. This entire this entire order. Um, so anyway, so then so then it was it was reestablished with the Princeton Order. As itself was 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 very small, and ultimately the Franklin and Marshall chapter, the Zeta chapter, was the was the only chapter of this of this order. Okay. So, um, and then they continued to to exist for a bit. So that was the Princeton order, um, and uh, the, the next order was the Southern order, which started in 1858, um, and uh, and this was really separate from 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 the Princeton order. And the other order was the Hobart Order, which started in 1860. So uh, both of these orders were uh, quite a bit bigger than the Princeton Order. The Southern Order um, had a lot of different uh, uh, chapters that were that were a part of it, um, and uh, operated very independently. Um, and uh, the Hobart Order was also was also pretty well established. So what ultimately happened is that none of these, um, you know, and, and I and I should note that the the Southern Order. Um, was also referred to as the Kai Fi, just the Kai Fi fraternity. Um, they also referred to themselves as a club, which is interesting. Yeah. And then the Hobart Order of 1860, uh, this was referred to as a secret order of, of Kai Fi. So each of these orders, just to reemphasize, they acted independently from each other. They all, they all had their own style badge. They all had their own ritual, mm -hmm. um, and they all they all had they they all had their own uh, um, uh, practices. And, uh, and, and constitutions and um, and their own sort of philosophy, if if, if you will, and then uh, ultimately um, the uh, there was a brother from the Hobart Order um, and a brother from Franklin and Marshall that ended up meeting at a train station. They noticed each other's badges. They noticed they're both Kai Fi badges, and and then they realized of their of their mutual existence. Um, and the Princeton Order. Just being the Franklin and Marshall chapter, they ended up you know, merging. Made sense. So then that, that was the the, the Northern uh, Union, and that happened in 1867. And then um, so there was then at that point there was the the, the Northern Order as it was referred to, and then the Southern yeah. Order. And um, and coincidentally, ultimately, um, someone from Hobart um, and someone from the Southern Order 
um, met at Union Station, another train station in, okay. uh, in, in New York City. Similarly, they recognized each other's badges. Um, and um, it wasn't as quick of, of, of a union as um, Hobart in Princeton, but ultimately to you know, graze over all the, the interim details, ultimately um, the Northern Order and Southern Order ended up forming in 1874. And this was called the, the United Order. So, um, and, and from that United Order, you might be thinking, well, if, you know, if each order had their own ritual, each order had their own constitution and they had their own badge, how did, how was that all reconciled? So, um, you know, ultimately most of, of, of what we use today regarding ritual uh, came from Hobart and um, the Chi Phi fraternity, which was um, what the Southern Order was referred to as that, that exact name is what is, is what stayed from the Southern Order. Um, there's some other nuanced stuff as well, but those are kind of the big, the big items. So that's a, that's a really quick over, you know, overview. A lot happened, of course, since, since oh, yeah. the order, but, um, but that's how we formed to be one, one fraternity. And I, you know, I should know during the civil war, there were, uh, we lost a ton of chapters, uh, obviously the men, all the men went out to, to war. Unfortunately, a lot of them, uh, passed away in, in battle and there were just no, some chapters that were started, uh, in, in in the South, primarily, just they, they didn't exist anymore because there were no other, no other brothers. I mean, the universities closed down. <laughs> they sent right. everyone off to war. So yeah, it was it was pretty traumatic. Yeah, and you know, fraternity life was way different back then. You spoke about how we kind of had to be had secret, to be secret out of necessity. necessity. Um, you know, how was fraternity life different back then as opposed to now? Yeah, that's a. Uh, that's a loaded question, but a very good one. I think, you know, so my answer is the, the meaning of the fraternity is the same. Um, the practices that we, and the values we should, we should espouse to all of that is, is a constant. Um, what, what really has changed and affected everything is just culturally things are much different. I mean, it was, uh, what was fashionable back in the 1800s and early 1900s is much different than now. I always um, reference, because uh, uh, I think it really exemplifies a huge difference, is that it was common for brothers to sit around a piano, uh, play songs, and sing, which seems like something you know so out of the ordinary and uncomfortable for us to do nowadays. Uh, so you know, things were a lot simpler and a lot. Um, there is the word innocent, you know, back, back then we didn't, there's so many distractions nowadays. And, and um, I, I think it's, I think ultimately it's harder for our brothers to get in touch with the emotional um, and historical component of the organization. Whereas, you know, back then um, these guys really, really lived it. And it was a really big part of their life. Their, their friend circle was, 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 um, what was their brothers? The ritual was done very seriously. It was uh, I was taken very seriously. It was it was very very respected. I think it was held. Fraternities were held kind of like the Masonic organization, a very high, very high standard. Not that they shouldn't be now, but um, you know we all know how fraternity life is persuaded and is portrayed in the in media now. And um, you know, so I think culturally it's 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 made Greek life um, uh, ultimately more of a, uh, a challenge to connect with for, um, for a lot of brothers. But, you know, but with that being said, um, things are, what I always find so interesting is that for, for, we often think that everything that we do, our, our, our ritual and our history, that it was, that it was written by a group of elders sitting around, you know, candlelight. Um, and all this stuff was written by undergraduates. I mean, the, 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 specifically the the ritual and I mean the foundations of the fraternity the creation of the fraternity it was it was all done by 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 undergraduate age brothers uh for the for the most part and this is stuff we're still doing today and just to, to speak to an initiation um in, in broad terms what, what we do today for initiation comes almost very it's very similar to what Hobart did um not verbatim, but um, but but very very similar, and and, and um, that that was created by a group of undergraduate brothers, and a lot of it um, is a nod towards Masonic tradition and symbolism, and um, and a lot of it is inspired by, by that. But um, 
but yeah, that's uh, kind of long and short. And it's one of the positives of being an undergraduate driven organization, you know, I mean, look at our um, creed. I mean, that was written by an undergraduate that felt like, you know, we needed to have something to speak to for recruitment. So right. yeah, the creed, um, that's, that's a, that's a cool, I'm glad you mentioned that the creed, I, I, I was actually amazed. I think a, a, a lot of us were amazed that the, the author of the creed is, is, uh, is still around. I think mm -hmm. everyone just sort of lost sight of that and, and assumed that uh, the creed was written, you know, back, back in the 1800s. It's just, it's a, it's a passage that we, uh, that we love so much and, and, and we, and so meaningful to the organization, but it, it was actually written in the, in the early eighties by uh, a brother named uh, Mark LaRue, who we, we recently tracked down. He lives down South in Alabama, uh, incredible brother, an amazing person, uh, incredibly kind and loves the fraternity. And uh, it was really special when we reached out to him and, and made him aware of the impact that the creed has made because he had no idea. Uh, he, he, had, he realized that we didn't have a creed as an undergraduate and he thought, well, you know, all organizations should, should have a creed. So he actually wrote the whole thing in about 20, 25 minutes because he knew exactly what he wanted to say. And it's, it's, it's a really cool uh, story of how he did it. And then he, he um, took it to Congress and it got passed to Congress. Um, and, and it's, it's been used pretty heavily, but he had no idea that how, how we use it, how meaningful it is. So when we made him aware of it, it was, it was really special for him. I mean, I could have swore it was ancient. Like, it has been around since our initiation and then you know he, right. he's well, well and that's john that's what's so cool about a lot of times i mean there's so much history that has been around for a long time but fraternity it's always evolving and it should it's not and that's why i know a lot of times where we think change is a bad thing and we're reluctant to change particularly on, a, on an undergraduate level you know i felt that when i was an undergraduate because no one really enlightened me on the bigger picture and and gave me a bigger sense for, for what um for the extent of, of the change through the years, but we're only here today as an organization because we were able to be nimble and change with times, whether it's cultural changes, you know, w w whatever it is, um, it's okay to change and add new things of, uh, along the way to enhance um, the experience uh, for our brothers and, and, and to make change that's going to be positive for the long-term success of the organization. Yeah, I mean, if we don't change, we'll be left behind. I mean, it's, that's, it's yeah, how it that's is. Right. Absolutely. So there's a lot of history with our fraternity, but really quick, what are a couple of your favorite chi fi fun facts that you just you know, want to put out there that you really enjoy? Yeah, that, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, what? there's there's one thing I read in the Chronicles years ago that always stuck me for some reason. There's a brother named Charles Hendricks, um, and I can't recall his original chapter, but he actually was the only brother that was initiated into all three orders. Originally. Oh, wow. Um, obviously he was initiated in some as, as an, as an alumnus, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he was Charles Hendricks. Um, I, I forget the rest of the details on him, but, but that always stuck, stuck me as an interesting fun fact. Also, as I mentioned before, both unions occurred um, at the chance meeting of, of brothers at a train station that saw each other's badges. And that's what ultimately formed the United Order of, of, of chi -Fi. Um, and I guess lastly, um, you know, it's, it's a bit general, but I, I, I was, when I first found out that we had the original initiation ceremonies for each of the three founding orders, Princeton, Southern, and Hobart, we, we, we have um, copies of those. I was, I was really uh, stunned. I mean, we have, um, we have a whole archives of nearly 2 million individual documents um, dating back to the 1800s that, uh, that really um, uh, articulate our history incredibly well, and it's a fun place to rummage through and uh, and dig up old artifacts. A lot of cool stuff. I mean, now's a great time to give a plug for the archives in our Greek Life Museum. Yeah, we so um, we, the Greek Life Museum was created by um, a, a committee of uh, brother volunteers. It's been a, a, a ton of time and, and energy and raising money to create. Um, a Greek life museum unique of its kind down in our, um, at our headquarters in Salani, Georgia. Um, our office is on the second floor of a two story building in, in the archives. Um, and the Greek life museum are on the first floor um, in, in, a, in a room off to the side. And the Greek life museum space 
it's one space and it's not just Kai-Fi artifacts, it's a Greek life museum. So we have um, Greek life uh, or information from um, uh, other fraternities, other sororities. It's, it's, it's a really cool spot to visit. And what's really interesting for us Kai-Fi is that we have the archives behind the museum um, and the archives as, as a visual, uh, it consists of a couple rows of shelving and we have boxes um, of each chapter um, organized um, uh, and and you can basically you can go in there and you can now I'm the side chapter Lehigh so I can find my side chapter box and pull that out and rummage through and see all the cool stuff um, in the archives for my chapter and we have we have minutes in there from um, we have minutes from the three founding orders these old minute books with um, really fancy cursive handwriting really um, nice handwriting yeah, it's uh, and we, we have and and you know just look back on that. It's so um, I, I don't want to digress here too much. I, I keep thinking of a little important tidbits. It's so important I mean, back then. You, you would be amazed at, at how well the undergraduates logged their history. I mean, we, we would have if it wasn't for um, the Zetas um, or whoever at the time was happened to be logging the history for them dur during meetings and, and other moments, we would have no idea what, what happened. But thank thankfully, um, that was really taken seriously. And, uh, and we have amazing minutes from, from most of our history. That's why it's so critical now that, that we still do, do a great job logging all of our, all, all of our meetings and all, everything that's happening in our chapters because 30, 40, 50 years from now, that stuff's really important. It may not seem significant now, uh, but, it's, but it certainly will be. And it's something very easy to do. It, it's so easy to log your history now. It's very easy to store it. You don't have to write. I mean, it, it's, it it's so right. easy. Mm -hmm. And very important. And then I had a question from Brother Benton out there at Ada Delta, um, and it's relevant to this topic. What is it about Kai Fi's history in particular that really clicked with, clicked with you to make you want to study it in as much depth and detail as you have? Uh, hey, Brother Benton. Good to Good to hear from you. Um, the, the, that's, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I think because um, I call myself a Kai-Fi and it's almost, if I, if I call myself self a Christian, but I don't know what the Bible is, um, it's, uh, it doesn't really make sense to call, call myself a Christian. So I, I, I'm, I'm a Kai-Fi and, and I, I, I want to know everything about what it means to be a Kai-Fi. And I find that I connect better and better with the fraternity the more uh, knowledge I have on our unique history that's specific to us. There's a lot of fraternal organizations out there and they all, and they all have their, their, their historical um, you know, facts and, 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 and trajectory through time. And, but, but I'm a Kai-Fi and we're, we have our, our own specific the timeline of, of, of events. And, and I find it incredibly fascinating that I'm part of this organization of so many men through the years that have done the same, we've, we've all been initiated the same way and, and, and we espouse the same values and we're all connected through, through our ritual. And, and that's really special and that's impacted me. That's touched me emotionally. And, and that's, I get chills when I, when I talk about it in, in depth because that's what it's all about. That's the brotherhood. Um, and, uh, so knowing the history for me, I, 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 I love just go diving in and, and, and pulling out, um, old, uh, old, old minutes or digging into the chronicles. There's, there's a lot of great resources now to get information, um, uh, about the fraternity. And the more that I learn, the more, uh, the closer I feel to, to the organization, the more excited about it, uh, quite frankly, because it's, it's a big part of my identity and a, a, a big part of, my life, uh, I spend thinking about Kai-Fi, helping Kai-Fis and doing things for Kai-Fi. And, um, and yeah, it's just that, it's that emotional connection that I've, that I've gained with the, with the uh, fraternity and that's specifically through, through our history. And speaking of things that, you know, cause a emotional connection, let's talk a little bit about our ritual. Um, all right. something that we've all been through and we've all, as you said, went through the same initiation. You know, mm -hmm. our brothers tend to get confused of what is ritual. You know, the big R ritual, what is that as a Kai-Fi? And if anyone's listening and you're worried we're going to go over any secret stuff, we're not. Don't worry about that. Um, we're not? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> that, that's one of the downfalls of being live. But uh, right. 
in, in a broad sense, you know, what is our ritual as a Chi Phi? Like, what do we consider as ritual in the Chi Phi fraternity? Yeah, I mean, you know, ritual, obviously, in the broadest sense of the term, ritual is waking up, brushing your teeth, and um, you know, make, making, your, making your coffee before you head out to work, or I now, I guess now head to your uh, dining room table yeah. to, to work for some of us. Um, you know, that's a very just a general sense of, of ritual, something that you just, you, you routinely do. So when specifically when it comes to our chi fi ritual, um, while that's also something routinely that you do, um, our chi fi ritual is very specific to our organization. And um, I'll go into in a bit what the chi fi ritual really means and what it embodies, but, um, but the, the ritual of the fraternity, um, it identifies who we are and it teaches us um, about the organization and most importantly teaches us to the commitment and values that we're all supposed to um, uh, understand and and ultimately live by with it. so if we didn't have a ritual um, we, we wouldn't be a fraternity that, that's that's a big part of what a fraternity's history is um, it's that secrecy component which which is our ritual it's the ritual um, connects us all and it's it's a way to um, talk about the higher meaning of the organization in a, in a more profound, through a more profound mechanism um, than just, you know, reading our history. It's, a ritual is a certain ambiance and atmosphere that you create to create a powerful moment to, um, to talk about the, the meaning of the organization. Okay. And you might have touched on this a little bit as well. Um, but why do you think our founders created our rituals, some of which we still follow today? I mean, our ritual is pretty old, right? So, you know, is it to gain an understanding? Is it to build these connections with one another? Why do you think our founders, you know, decide to create these? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a specific answer to that. I will say that the origins of the fraternity are based upon secrecy, as I explained with the Princeton order. So it, 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 everything was, 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 um, was done behind closed doors. Uh, very discreet, um, and there was the tradition, well, what became the tradition of um, if somebody wants to be a part of that organization, they have to be initiated to be in there. There has to be some sort of process to know that they're going to take it seriously, and, and, and they're going to be, they're going to be, um, they're going to uphold a certain vow, a certain code of ethics, uh, have a certain level of, in, of um, truth, honor, integrity, and this is where our, our values start to come in. Um, to, to be a part of the organization, it's not it's not it's not it's not a club where where everyone's invited to. So the the ritual began, or my my belief of this, we don't really necessarily have this yeah. log anywhere in terms of, of whether this is true or not. But logically, you can kind of deduct this that it, it a ritual um, formed out of um, a mechanism of it admitting members into the organization. Um, we have multiple rituals that we do now. Um, that have come through the years. Originally, um, it was just it, it was just a form of initiation, where basically I would I would meet you, John, uh, on the street. We we would become buddies. Um, I realized that hey, we, we have we are very similar um, in a lot of ways, and I think you'd be a good fit for this organization. And then you know we we bring you in and we initiate you, and then you would become a brother. This whole process of new member education and 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 having. Kind of a trial or growth period um, before you do become initiated with something more modern. That's not what it was originally um, it started started as. And remember too, a lot of this comes from from the Masons. Um, a lot of what we do um, wasn't just out of thin air. Yeah. A lot of it is is um, practiced from uh, from Masonic organizations. Does, 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 that, does that clarify the answer? Yeah. Yeah, and then. You know, what makes our ritual special for us and why should, should we treat it, treat it as such? You know, some of our groups that may not really care. I mean, why is it special? Well, you know, so I, I, I did touch on the, and, I'll, and I want to reiterate is that it's special because it's, it's, it's our identity. I mean, if we don't, if we don't have ritual, we, we, we all know what the three star custom book is, which is I always equate to our, to our Bible. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, not many of us have actually looked through that front to back and really know it as well as we should. But that is, in that book it is our identity. Our history was formed from that book. Um, that book um, tells us who we are. Um, it tells us how we're supposed to um, uh, 
behave as Kai-Fi's, uh, what we're supposed to up uphold, how we're supposed to live. Um, it's, uh, that book is everything. So um, if you don't know that, um, or if you don't care about that, you know, I question, then why are you a Kai-Fi, right? I mean, that's what, it's a, it, we should all have an interest in that book um, and make an effort to understand what's in there um, because that's, that's what ultimately uh, defines who we are as Kai-Fi's. And I can tell you, you know, once you do, if, if for those of you that don't feel an emotional connection to paternity and it's purely social um, and, and, you know, social is a big part of it and that's, it's, yeah. it's a wonderful part of it. And ultimately it's, it's, it's Kai-Fi is, is, is friendship based. Going back to the beginning of the organization, it always talks about Kai-Fi is about friendship. That's, that's very foundational, but it's, it's more than that. It, 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 it it's our ritual. It's the emotional connection. Um, so it's, it's important that, um, that, that, that resonates. What I was saying is, is that the more you understand our ritual and understand where we come from and, and how we're all connected, um, through our ritual, because we've, we've all gone through initiation, um, that makes it really special. And that, and that, um, that's what it's all about for me. If I could just, just one quick tangent, yeah. um, if I could, John, one thing that, um, to me really was one of my most magical moments um, as a Kai-Fi was we, um, uh, my chapter, we, we, we had some issues and we had to, um, we had to get rid of, uh, put on alumni status, our brotherhood, and we, we had to start fresh the next semester. And we brought about class of 12 uh, brothers um, into the fraternity and, and, and we had to initiate them. And there were no undergraduates there to initiate the 12 new guys. So uh, myself and a bunch of alumni um, from my chapter, we all initiated these young uh, 18, 19 year olds and all the alumni range in age from, I think the, old, the oldest one, I think was 75 or, oh, wow. or 78. Uh, I was, I always like, I've, I've always been like the, the youngest involved in this stuff. So I was the youngest and then it was went up from there. So to see everybody perform that, um, it was, it was a really powerful moment. And to me that like, that just exemplified, this is, this this is such a historic and special group I'm a part of. It just transcends decades and decades and decades. And, you know, we're all part of this together. I can't think of another organization that has that sort of power to it. So anyway, I just wanted to note that I thought it was relevant to that, to that commentary. Of course. I mean, that's one of the things I love about helping to start up new groups is getting alumni back involved and back into a ritual and studying it and getting to know it again, because a lot of the alumni may not have seen it since they were an undergraduate. So just seeing them read through it, it's really powerful and impactful. Right, and, absolutely. And then, you know, some of our chapters, they may do the ritual. You know, they may do it and, you know, walk through it and all that, but they're not actually studying it. So, you know, why should you actually study the ritual instead of just saying, all right, today we're doing initiation. Cool. All right, we're done. Yeah, you know, it, it's, um, I, I, I totally get it. You know, I, I've, haven't been in the undergraduate shoes. I know a lot of times you just, you, you, you just go through the motions. Everyone's a little restless and that's just the reality of how it is. But the solution to that is, and I, and I, and I know this works because I've, I've seen chapters changed, um, is that when you understand what you're reading and what you're doing, um, it has an impact. And if, if you just read through the lines and your head's somewhere else and you're not really understanding or digesting either what the symbolism is of, of, of what's being done, um, the meaning of any sort of oaths that are being taken, what you're committing yourself to. Um, a, a lot of times when we're in the process of performing this stuff, we're not thinking about what we're actually saying and doing. So therefore, we're not going to have any, we're going to have zero connection because we're just, we're just reading words off of a piece of paper and, and, and it ends there. And then we you know, put the book away and then next time to do it, we, we pull it out. So the, the, the way to, to fix that is you have to start incorporating um, into your conversations uh, you know, elements of, what's, of, of, of what happened. So let's just say you know, initiation is an easy one to talk about. So you, you do initiation. Instead of, instead of when it's over, just moving on to the next thing, at the next chapter meeting or, or you know, shortly thereafter, talk about with the guys what 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 that was all about. At the very least, talk with the, the new brother about the oath they took and the, and the commitment that they made. Um, the Zeta at every meeting, 
um, for example, could um, take two minutes and talk about something ritual related and say, hey, in this ceremony, you know, this is this is what we're this is what's happening in this ceremony. Here's a cool line that is in the oath that we all took. And this is what it means. Remember, we, we committed to this. You know, just it doesn't it just has to get it has to be routine um, and it should there should you know, it should be incorporated. Talking about ritual should be incorporated into uh, in, in, into the routine of of, of, of the chapters because um, it's it, it, it's not right now ultimately. So therefore, there's no connection. I mean, it makes perfect sense. It's yeah. there's no connection because it's not talked about. Therefore, it's not understood. Therefore, there's you know there, no one. It almost seems burdensome sometimes to chapters that have to go through it. Um, you know, I hear oftentimes chapters with, with larger number of men to initiate. Oh, it's going to take so long. Oh, this is, you know, how do we make shortcuts? How do we, well, I, this, you know, this is one or two days of your life. This is, this is incredibly important. Certainly you can find a way to muscle through and make this happen. And if you understand the impact that it has on each, each man and the importance of it, the history of it, how this was written in 1860 by Hobart brothers, and that we've all gone through this. It's not something that should be rushed or not taken seriously or hyphenated. Um, you know, there, there's it's it's incredibly important, and that's the culture that we're working towards trying to build in all our chapters. And you know, there's a lot of challenges to to the reality of all that, but we've we've added a lot of resources, uh, which I assume we can talk about at some yeah. point later in the call. But um, but uh, but yeah, that's. So, so you might say talking about rituals should become a ritual within your chapters. You know, I was actually I was tempted to to, to actually count on the same thing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. 100 percent should be. It, it, it's it's got to be integrated. And um, it's if you if it's looked at as something not cool to talk about. I mean, listen, it's I mean we're not we're 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 more than just a social organization. We have a rich history, which I've been talking about this entire call, and. Um, and I, I, and I do see a lot of undergraduates that get that and, 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 and it excites them and, um, and it should because you're part of something very, very special. And, um, and the only way you realize that is when you start to understand the deeper meaning, which is in our ritual. I mean, I don't know how people could think that it's not cool. I mean, going through initiation, I've gone through it so many times and I still right. get worked up about it. I still think it's cool. And my wife still asks me what I'm doing and I still don't tell her. Um, so, good, good man. <laughs> It, it's great. So, you know, we're, we're touching on sort of the same topics, you know, and we're just walking on through this. And, you know, we have these groups that do do a ritual, but then there's some that may not feel like they have the time. Really quickly, you know, what do you have to say to these members that just don't have the time to do a ritual? They say, I'm just, I have to study. I have classes. We're all super busy. You know, I hear you. I hear you that it's important. It's what makes us Kai Fives, but I don't have the time. Yeah, well, uh, the reality is the time has to be made. I mean, is there time for, uh, you know, a party on a Friday night? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is. Um, you know, we listen, We everyone's got busy schedules, especially nowadays, which I was talking about earlier, how life is much more complicated now. Um, we have cell phones that are distracting us constantly. There's just so much more going on, so much more stimulation in the world than there was, um, you know, d d decades, decades ago. So you have to, you have to be really strategic about it. And you, have, you have to plan ahead and you have to make sure um, you're organized with your ritual schedule. Beginning of the um, beginning of the semester, it's got to be planned out. Make sure you communicate with the, with the, with the whole chapter and, um, and figure out when everyone can, can attend. And it's, it's not an option. It's a requirement. And it ha it has to it has to fit in to the to the routine and schedule of the chapter. And equally important is that when we recruit new men, you know, this goes back to the cultural component. Um, the, the, there has to be an awareness um, that the new men have of the obligation and commitment that they're making. Right? It's it's not a club. There's there's more responsibilities to joining Kai Fi than there is a club. There's a certain expectation that you have to that you have to adhere to just like you know when you're working a job um you can just say well i don't feel like coming in today um you know, that, that that's that's not going to cut it you know it might be an extreme example but you know but the ritual is kind of similar that's that's yeah. that's a critical part of your commitment uh to the organization it's not only um uh the chapter doing ritual together but it's also the expectation that you're gonna you're gonna conduct a ritual um 
as best as possible for the new men. That's really, really important. Um, it, it always aggravates me and, and quite frankly disappoints me because I know the negative impact it has when I see um, the certain ceremonies that we use during our uh, the new member education period uh, and they're just not performed well and they're, and they're, they're not taken a, either seriously or they just feel rushed. Um, the setup's not right. It sets such a bad example, and then it just prolongs the you know, the, 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 the the culture of, of of poor ritual practice. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, it just you know, there it's not optional. It has to fit in. You have to, you have to be organized. You know, everybody's busy. You have to be organized in in advance of, of how you're going to fit it in and be creative. Um, you know, if you can reach out to me in terms of specifics, I have a lot of ideas um, in terms of initiation and, and, and how when you have large classes, I understand it takes a lot of time, it's challenging. There's ways um, where we're not, we're not changing the ceremony, but we can be strategic with how um, uh, operationally things can flow so it's not too overwhelming from, from a time perspective. I will say that is the key to achieving an initiation of a large class. I've done initiations of 40 plus men in a day it's just about being smart of how you're doing it and making sure it flows well and you're not taking right. anything from the ceremony. Yeah, there, there, there's, um, it, I, without getting any details on this call, there's, you know, there's certainly different options you have mm -hmm. to, um, to um, uh, expedite and systematically run that where it doesn't detract or shorten or change the experience of the actual ceremony. Of course. And then... You know, sometimes we as Kai Fi brothers tend to lose our way and, you know, what it means to be a Kai Fi. You know, we're given this tool of ritual and how, how might that tool help us find our way back, find our path back, find our meaning of being a Kai Fi brother? You, you know, but I always, I mean, so I've, initiation, I've, I've read through, boy, pro, I mean, probably uh, maybe hundreds of times at this, yeah. at the point, either, either performed or, or actually read, you know, read through the script for various <laughs> reasons, but I still, you know, I still take notes when I read through the oath. And for me, if you've, if you've lost sight or feel detached uh, from the fraternity and, and are trying to get emotionally re-engaged, you know, I, I, I would recommend reading the oath and what you promised um, uh, when, when you went through initiation and, and think, well, am I really, am I, am I really doing that? Am I, am I, am I being the brother I, sh I should be? Uh, and also think about all of the brothers and other men that have read that and gone through that, gone through that ceremony. Um, really special. And also, similarly, the alumni installation ceremony, um, which um, I know not everyone has done, but um, it is something that um, chapters should be doing. It was written in the um, early 1990s, um, actually by somebody on staff at the time, Mike uh, Ohart. Um, or Earhart, I believe his last name is uh, pronounced. He lives in Seattle now. And it's an awesome ceremony. And it actually basically reminds you of the commitment that you made um, as a brother in the various oaths you took. You know, if you took in um, pledge ceremony and then, and then initiation, and it reminds you what your obligation is as an alumnus. And I always, I just think that that oath in that ceremony is just dynamite and really summarizes um, how I should be um, acting as a Kai Fi, what my obligations of the fraternity are, and then lastly, the creed. You know, the creed is just um, is just magic. That's yeah. that's 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 just magic, and that that always sort of gives me gives me chills. It just reminds me of the bigger picture and the connection that we all have. I, mean, I meet a, I, I meet new Kai Fi's all the time, and I feel like I feel like you know we're friends, and I've known them. It's just it's amazing. You meet a stranger. But they're not a stranger because they're a Kai Fi. You're instantly connected. That's the magic of the brotherhood. I always love hearing a large group of brothers read, uh, read or say the creed. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. It I is. Mean, it gives you chills. Yeah, and we have you know we we, we sing gather brothers uh, mm -hmm. uh, pretty routinely after we say the prayer at Kai Fi events, and we always encourage our our chapters um, to to do the same when they say the prayer. They sing sing a verse in the chorus of gather brothers. And you know, that's one of those things too. If you just sing it and don't think about what you're singing, you might have not have the impact. Mm -hmm. But if you read the words in that, uh, it, it's it's really special. And um, you know, all those little and, and that's a you know, that's a that's a ritual. That's a yeah. 
that, that's something that, that, that we do. It's not a formal ritual, if you will, but it's perhaps it's more of a tradition. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's something that is really powerful and, and speaks to the brotherhood. I mean, all this stuff that we have a lot of different passages out there, songs and things in our history that talk about the bond of brotherhood and, and, and how special that is. And, and, um, and especially when, it, when it's done through music, it makes it even more powerful. Uh, so there's a lot of little nuggets of grace over there and all that stuff um, is great material to, to read, to really you know, re-energize yourself and, and, and remind yourself of the, uh, of, of the power of Kai-Fi and the, and, the, and the brotherhood and network that we're all a part of. And there's more than one verse of Gather Brothers. So <laughs> there <Yeah>. are. <laughs> better and better. I know. So But it's after... that it's, it's that darn scene thing that everyone hates to do. I know. It everyone most people have the first verse down specifically at Congress, but if you try to extend it past that, it, it gets a little rough. You know, speaking of, of music, real quick, for any undergraduates mm -hmm. that might listen to this, um, just so you know, uh, all of the music uh and it's recorded and it's on Kai-Fi Connect. So the music that is required for ritual um, and the candle ceremony um, in uh, libations, uh, uh, initiation, um, all of those, um, uh, there's music available uh, on Kai-Fi Connect. So you know how all of those songs go um, and you can practice and sing along properly. Perfect. I gotta get those voices tuned in. That's so. Right. The last question we have specifically about ritual is kind of a philosophical one. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, why is ritual still so important? Maybe more so today. That's an excellent question. Um, well, I don't want to be redundant with, with, with what I previously said, but, um, but I think I need, I need to be to a certain extent because ritual, <laughs> again, um, ritual defines who we are. Um, and, um, and without an understanding of it, um, we're not really being authentic to saying we're, we're, we're a Kai-Fi. And in today's world, I think, unfortunately, it's harder for, and I'll just focus on the undergraduates for a moment, it's harder for them to connect with, with the ritual and with the bigger meaning of the fraternity because it just is because culturally things are so much different than, 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 than what they were. And I think the power of the fraternity and the emotional connection is a little harder for, um, for undergrads to, to, to connect with, just because it might seem so far removed um, that it's challenging to grasp the understanding of it. Um, and um, you know, because of that, uh, it's so important that we do understand it and practice it because it's it's a harder thing i feel like for brothers to attain now uh, the, the connection i'm talking about and it's just because of you know all the all the um you know, busy busy schedules and um and and all the the negative um press fraternities get and it's just it's it's sort of really i think warped perception of fraternities to a certain extent and 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 um and the realignment that can happen is, um, and there's chapters out there that, that do great with ritual and they, and they get it and they understand it. And, and, um, and they feel really honored to be a part of the, part of the fraternity. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're a chapter that, um, is complacent or, you know, it's rituals, just something that's not, um, uh, focused on in your chapter, um, you know, do your, do your best to, to start to understand it and reach out to myself and there's um, and others and there's a lot of resources out there uh, we we have now. But you know, once you understand uh, the importance of the connection and the, and, and the bigger meaning, um, I think all of a sudden the light bulbs are going to go off and you'll and you and you'll realize, wow, this is really something special. This is more than just you know a group of friends that that hang out and do uh, you know, and, and and be social. It's it's a lot more powerful. And then speaking of resources, I mean, you're just helping my transition so much. Um, what are some resources for the brothers, you know, alumni and undergraduates who may want to focus more on ritual and bring more knowledge back to their chapters? Sure. Yeah, we, um, we my, myself and a, a few other really dedicated alumni, uh, Brother Brad Ellis, um, Dan uh, uh, Kucher, who's on the national staff, um, uh, Clark, uh, uh, Jonathan C.D. Rawls and um, 
uh, and, and, and others, but the, the group of us, we, we've been on a committee together for a number of years and we've, we've made uh, a lot of efforts uh, to create resources and programming opportunities for undergraduates because we realized that, uh, that it just wasn't focused on uh, at, at all. And, and that was really the uh, main reason that, that we believe that it, it really isn't ingrained in the culture like it should be because it wasn't really talked about. It was just a book yeah. that was there that you pick up and do. So what we did was we, we um, I think it was back three or four, I think four years ago now, we, yeah. four or five years ago, we, we, we created something called the Regional Ritual Retreat. We thought, okay, we have programs like the RLA, we have the Alpha Thetis Academy, um, we had C COE years ago, and, and we thought, well, why do we have nothing about our ritual when the ritual is our foundation? That's ultimately, you know, that's a, that's that's the core of what everything needs to be built off of. Without that foundation, everything falls down. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have an organization. Yeah, we didn't have any training on that. So we developed the regional ritual retreat, um, which is a it's it's a really immersive uh, program Friday through through Sunday. And um, the cool thing about it is that it's it's all brothers. Um, and uh, our other program. That's not typically the case. We have facilitators that um, that are not brothers, uh, which is fine. It just it's a slightly different experience. So with ritual, obviously, it needs it needs to be all brothers. So it's immersive. We're all brothers. We're all together. We usually have twenty to twenty five attendees. Um, it's usually primarily undergraduates, but some alumni usually come as well. And we talk. Um, we spend the whole weekend um, talking about uh, our ritual, our history. We perform all the rituals talk about all, all of the equipment, I mean, everything you can imagine, all the symbolism, all the secrets. And um, we've, uh, we hold this throughout the country. Um, we've been doing it three different locations, usually the Northeast, the Southeast, and, and out West. Unfortunately, this year, we, we had to cancel all three because of the coronavirus, but we'll start them up again next summer. And what's been so exciting about this is, you know, obviously, it's something I'm passionate about, so I, I always look forward to it. And But, but what's so rewarding is that, um, you know, almost without fail, you know, every brother usually leaves that program really amped up. So all the stuff I talked about earlier in this call, uh, you can see it working because we, we, we enlighten the brothers on, on the, the breadth of our history and, and how important the organization is and, and the meaning behind what we do. And when they understand the meaning, um, they get really, the brothers usually get really, really pumped up and they, and they're really super energized to come back to their chapters. And, and yeah, that's when it gets more challenging. And how do you take the information to implement at your chapter? If you're the only one that is really caring about ritual and we talk about ways, you know, ways to do that and to, and to incorporate it. We talk about the, the relevance of ritual today, specifically how you can apply lessons from ritual into recruitment, um, into new member education and to all facets of an undergraduate life. Um, so that program has been really, uh, really, I think, profound for the for the um, for the fraternity and and really helpful. And we're going to continue to to grow and grow that. And and from that, we've created a lot of different resources um, on, on online. We have we have a personal um, our committee has a personal drive just filled with all sorts of historical information, categorizing different folders, um, songs, um, all kinds of great stuff on Kai-Fi Connect. Um, if you were not aware, there's a, there's a ritual folder there. It's the whole equipment list, where to get all the equipment, um, what ceremonies it's used. So um, we, we, we have a, a, a ton of material um, that, um, that is accessible. Nice. And then I also had a question um, asking about the Goliard program. Uh, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about the experience going through it and if it's a focus all chi might want to explore. Sure. Yeah. So the Goliard program is really cool. And um, under the direction of, of uh, Clark, who's on the committee, he's really done a great job with um, getting more brothers involved and ultimately um, you know, passing through the program to become Goliards. Goliard is a designation for a, a, a ritual uh, expert. And um, there's only, a, a, I forget the exact number now, there were 12 for, for many, many years. And it's, it's more recently grown, which is yep. great. I think there's 18 or 19 now total tops, maybe. Anyway, um, there's a goalyard. Uh, it, it's it, it's a process where you you um, have to you know go through all the ceremonies, witness the ceremonies, and then you ultimately take a test at the end, which um, it's a I think it's a hundred hundred question uh, test currently, 
which you have to um, get a certain percentage on. And if you pass that test, uh, that it proves that you um, uh, have achieved and are uh, deserving of the Goliard status. And then if you want to take it further, there's something called scholarly Goliard, where um, if you if you do something um, basically like a like an Eagle Scout project, <laughs> if, if if you will, um, that uh, would, would give you that status. Whether it's you do a, a, a there's some sort of research that benefits the fraternity. If you're involved in some sort of ritual creation, um, you know, there's a whole host of different p- potentials. But ultimately, the goal of the Goliard is to have, it'd be great to have a Goliard from each chapter. I mean, the Gol- Goliard vision is to have a team of ritual experts spread across the country that are resources for our chapter, uh, for our chapters. So, um, you know, if I'm the side chapter and I, and I, and I, I'm an undergraduate and I want ritual help, you know, there should be somebody close by in Philadelphia to be able to you know, drive up there and, and help out. So we're getting there. Right now there's more awareness of the program out there. Um, we're getting there and with the triple R, more and more brothers are becoming interested in engaging ritual. So we're slowly, slowly building um, that, that body of, uh, of Goliath. So if you're interested, you know, reach out to me. I can get you, um, get you looped into that program. And on that note, you know, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, Telephone or uh, email. I guess my email is probably a good first step, um, which is just sheller at kifi.org, S C H E L L E R at kifi.org. Awesome. And then, final question you know, one of the things we hear from some of our chapters, specifically the newer ones, that's preventing them from doing these rituals is they don't have the necessary equipment. Um, mm-hmm. Are there any resources for? those chapters that want to do the ritual, but they just don't have the stuff that they needed. Yeah. You know, I, I hear, I hear that a lot. And every time somebody asks me how they can, that they, they say, Hey, I want to do ritual. But you just can't get these items. We always find a way to help, to help them with that. We, um, uh, have always had some level of financial means, um, in, in a ritual budget that we can help chapters, um, uh, if, if needed, uh, on, on the case by case situation with, helping them attain equipment um, in terms of what you specifically need. And if you're unclear on that, um, Ki-Fi Connect has a spreadsheet on it that itemizes everything out um, and it shows where you can get it from and it shows what ceremony that it's used in. And the reality is most of the equipment um, is, not, uh, is not very expensive. Um, mm-hmm. There's a handful of items that are sort of the core items, if you will. And those are usually the higher the higher tickets. So once you have that foundation, all the other items are um, are not as uh, not as expensive. So uh, between the spreadsheet and uh, yeah, that should give you clarity. And if there's there's serious financial challenges that your chapter is having, but you really want to do ritual, reach out to me, and uh, and we'll figure something out. We have many times in the past for those chapters. Nice. So that's all the questions we have. I have a. A couple more from the audience, if you don't mind us touching on yeah. those. Could, you know, could I add one quick thing before yeah. we? I don't want to forget the custom book. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been working on a uh, a new edition of that, uh, which we're really excited about. And uh, I'm surprised my excitement on this topic didn't uh, make me speak about it earlier. And I forgot to, <laughs> to mention <laughs> it as a question. <laughs> the, the committee I mentioned earlier. Everyone's been working really diligently. Um, for over two years now, actually, we, we have had uh, usually weekly calls, um, uh, more or less, uh, for a number of years, and, and we, we've gone through the entire custom book, the current edition, and uh, we've, we've kind of scrubbed it um, uh, in, in, in terms of seeing what's actually there now and how to um, enhance it. Uh, we didn't change uh, any of the, the core ritual. We've simply helped to clarify things. Um, we all know that uh, a lot of areas of that book are not clear when it comes to initiation, for example. Um, and as a result, since there is a lack of clarity on direction, a lot of chapters take certain liberties and do things differently than they should. Um, it, a lot of that stems from just not really knowing exactly how to do a certain part. So uh, we've clarified all the uh, ceremonies. We've added diagrams to um, articulate more clearly what setups are and transitions. That will help a lot. (laughs) Yeah, we've organized everything. So all the the format of each ceremony looks the same. Beginnings and intro There's a list of equipment that you need. There's a list of all the roles that you need. 
Um, and then there's a, and then it's the ceremony. We've, we've added the equipment list into the book. We've added sheet music into the book that you need for ritual. We've added a glossary of terms. Um, we've added uh, some history, the creed. Um, so we've, uh, and we've also, um, there's some ceremonies, triple origins, uh, alumni installation that, that we've added into there that, um, that we're not currently in there because they came into place you know, post last production of the book. But, uh, but we're really pumped. It's gonna be, uh, the ultimate goal was to make a uh, really user-friendly uh, but comprehensive um, book that would really benefit uh, all the chapters. And uh, we think we're, we're really pumped about it. And, and each chapter is gonna get six books. Unlike now, each chapter only gets two. Wow. So you have to either pass the book around for certain rituals or, or um, make photocopies, which you, which you shouldn't be doing. But um, it makes it a lot easier if there's six books um, to actually perform the uh, required uh, roles in some of the ceremonies. So that's going to come out. Um, in it, we were planning that coming out um, this fall, but there's been some unexpected um, challenges with the coronavirus. So it's going to be delayed a, a little bit longer, but, uh, but you can see that and uh, you'll see that in, in the near future. I know the diagrams and the list of equipment needed is going to be very beneficial. Yeah. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be a good resource for our chapters. Awesome. So um, one question that we've been asked the past couple of weeks, and um, I figured now is the best time to really ask it. Um, with coronavirus, we've had to create sort of a virtual initiation. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? How's it gone? And what do you have to say to chapters that may be on the fence about potentially trying this out? Sure, that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, Brother Azarian uh, and, and Grand Alpha Brother Walker approached me a number of weeks ago and said, hey, Matt, you know, we should start thinking about a virtual initiation, um, depending you know, how things um, continue and how long uh, students are away from campus. And my, my first, you know, as a purist, my first thought was that they're crazy. There's no way we can, yeah. no way we can do this. Um, and then after my emotions tempered a little bit, uh, I, I was thinking, well, you know, we, we probably should enter, we, we should en entertain this. So I was thinking, well, you really can't duplicate initiation. Um, the, 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 it's just something, as we all know, um, you know, the, the theatrics and just the whole implementation and impact of it, it's something that has to be done in person. But when I, you know, sat down and talked to a few others and, and thought about, well, what really makes a brother uh, from out of initiation? What are sort of, what's sort of the, 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 the core of initiation that's really critical? If you strip away all the pop and circumstance and the, and, you know, and the symbolic passages and, and, um, and, and, and theatrics. And you know, there were a couple elements um, and, and those are the elements that we, that we ultimately use to create a virtual initiation. And our, our, our goal was not to duplicate and try to em emulate or mimic in any way our actual initiation, because we don't want to detract from that. So we yeah. created something completely new, but that still had those, those, there's three core items that we believe are the kind of the, the items that really make you a brother in that. So we took those and then we created a ceremony uh, based off of that. And a lot of the pieces of the, uh, the language used in the ceremony are actually from the three um, original initiation ceremonies from the Princeton, Southern, and Hobart order. I mentioned earlier that we still have those mm -hmm. scripts. So there's some really profound passages in those. So we sort of uh, plucked some of that stuff and pieced it together. And, um, and uh, you know, it doesn't, it's being done through a computer. So it doesn't have the, uh, the typical ritualistic ambiance to it. But the words that are being said and the meaning behind it, uh, we think is really special and, um, and it's, uh, you know, the Grand Council has voted on it and it, 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 it officializes brothers um, just through, you know, a slightly different, different means. But uh, we've, we've initiated a number of chapters. Um, we have another chapter coming up that we're initiating virtually. And, um, and it's really cool. It's been, it's, it's been received well. And after the, after the ceremony, uh, which I, uh, myself and the, um, the Grand uh, Alpha Bob Walker have been conducting, um, after that ceremony, when a, a brother goes or a new member goes through it, a candidate for initiation, they become an official brother 
um, after it. And then what's really neat is that we have an opportunity after the fact to talk about um, the initiation ceremony, which I, I love because as I mentioned earlier, typically at our chapters, the ceremony's done, everyone's kind of tired and then it's just not talked about. But here we, we spend a few minutes, all of us together uh, over the computer and we talk about uh, and review the the oath that was taken and the you know the, the, the meaning behind what that moment um, is all about nice and I'm excited um, I'm hoping I could witness it some at some point soon but I've heard really good things about it and I mean it it sounds like it's working really well so um, great job on that <laughs> um, and then a final question it's another tough one if the British Secret Service made you the new 007, which car would you, which car would you want Q to modify into your high-end spy vehicle? Wow, that that's was a, that's that a was, fantastic question. That was from Brother Benton I, out there. I, 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 I love the old school um, uh, Land uh, Land Rovers. Um, the I, I the uh, I just actually took a picture of two. But I saw and sent to a friend because he's obsessed with them too, um, and I'm, I'm I'm not sure what year they're from, but they're the old, almost like army mm -hmm. type looking bodies. The jeeps, they're awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's my dream to uh, scoop one of those up someday. So I think it would be that car. Nice. That, that's a good choice. Very rugged. You should be. Oh, you should yeah. be fine with it. it. Goes. It goes with the longer hair. <laughs> well, awesome. Do you have any final words that you want to say before we close this out? Um, I, I, I think I, um, I think I was probably pretty verbose and said, and said plenty of things, but just in <laughs> summation, um, you know, I, I urge, um, chapters to reach out, um, get in touch. I, I, I and I'd love to be able to help as best I can to uh, help energize your chapters with, with ritual. If you guys ever want someone like myself or, another Goliard or, um, you know, someone that, that knows ritual and has passion ritual to come to your chapters to do any sort of session. Um, we'd be more than happy to, there's a ton of volunteers like myself who love the fraternity and love to help, um, the undergrads. Um, so please utilize us. And I, you know, I promise you once you, once you understand the ritual and it makes an impact, it completely changes your experience as a Kai Fa. And most importantly, you know, and I don't mean to talk directly to the undergraduates here, oh, no. but, but uh, you know, when you when you graduate, you know, actually this goes for alumni as well. Uh, it, it's staying involved is so rewarding, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of uh, a lot of brothers don't stay involved, um, and they uh, you, know, you get busy with life, which I totally get. We all have a million things going on, but it's been so rewarding to meet. Uh, and work with so many Kai Fi's and we're all the same mission and we're all, you know, we're all dedicated to the fraternity and um, especially now it's a lot of challenging times. So it's, it's, it's really exciting. And um, it's, it's really special to you know, come together as a group from all parts of the country and, and, you know, and work on issues that better the fraternity and just incredibly rewarding. And there's a lot of ways to get involved as, as, as an alumnus. Um, so if you're listening and you want to get involved, please please reach out to us and um, and 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 we can help you with that because uh, the experience as an undergraduate, as I said before, while it certainly has a lot of rewarding moments, um, I, I, I can guarantee your experience as an alumnus uh, is probably going to be a lot more fulfilling. And the reality is, Chi Phi doesn't end when you graduate. Chi Phi is a it's a lifelong commitment. And in the oath that you took in initiation you're promising to stay involved for your life and to, uh, to be a dedicated member. And, uh, and, and it's, it's our obligation. So uh, those are my parting words. I, I, I you know, I, I hope, uh, hope some brothers out there take them to heart and, uh, and circle back and get involved. Definitely utilize brother Scheller. If you're listening, if you have any questions about ritual or history, or if you want to get involved, um, we've talked about this before, you know, we need more alumni involvement. Um, specifically now more than ever, our chapters need guidance and, you know, what better people than our alumni that went through the same ritual as we did and, you know, are a little more seasoned and, and know their way around the block. So, um, Brother Scheller, thank you so much for joining me today on this recording and on this episode. I really appreciate it. Um, anyone that's watching, if you want to share this with anyone, you know, if you want to share it to your Facebook page for your alumni or your chapter, 
The recording will be avail available right after we close this out. And then our next two confirmed guests are brother Matt Schultz from Tau Theta um, 2020 up there at CMU. He's talking about the new colony experience and what it's like starting up a new chapter. So that's going to be a great conversation. Um, he's freshly graduated and he's getting his way into the real world now. So um, hopefully he'll be able to stay involved with Kai-Fi as he continues on his journey as an alumni. And then after that, we are joined by another member of the Grand Council, brother... Uh, David Ebner, our Grand Delta, he's talking about diversifying your chapter and personal income. And that's a good conversation for today. Um, you know, our chapters need more money and, you know, everyone's starting to do these side gigs. So he's going to talk a little bit about that. So if you have any questions for these guests, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And um, until next time, thank you all so much for joining me and y'all stay safe and we'll see